recognition of where we were before we knew Jesus and then what he can do. It's called Living Hope. How great the chasm that lay between us How high the mountain I could not climb In desperation I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. And through the darkness, your loving kindness tore 
Father, that's the truth right there, Lord. May it just be something which inspires us, sets us free, resets our paths, and gives us a clear vision for how we can tell more people about this amazing love. And all of this for Jesus' sake. Amen. Amen. I love it. Please take your seats. And there's something else coming out, something special, something real special. It's a rarity we get to see this guy on the stage, but here he is. It's David Rose. Yes. 
Well, I'm not going to live up to that now, am I? Thanks a lot, Rob. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm not just putting my reading glasses on to look more intelligent. It is genuinely a sign of me getting old, I'm afraid. Um, I'm delighted to be able to speak to you this morning. Uh, Jeff and Hillary invited me to speak because of our focus on Alpha this morning. Um, I have spoken at many Alpha course over the years. I have seen firsthand the impact that God can have through the Alpha course. And so it's a privilege to come and speak to you this morning. Um, if you have a Bible with you, uh, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, Ephesians chapter 1. Uh, that's where we're going this morning. And while you do that, um, let me ask you a rhetorical question. Okay, let me ask you a rhetorical question. What do you think the main point of the church on earth is? Why are we here? Why has God placed us here? I heard a sermon on this recently, and, and the preacher's answer really challenged me because there are a number of ways you can answer that question, of course. You could say, well, we are here to, to worship God together. We are here to learn about God together. We are here to fellowship with each other as a community. And all those things are true, and all those things are important. But when we are in heaven, we'll be worshiping perfectly. We'll be at, we'll be at Jesus' feet. We'll be a perfect community of of, of worshippers together. So, so it, it can't just be that, because if it were that, then why aren't we just in heaven? Why are we here? Why has God put us here? Let me ask you the question another way. Do you ever look at the world, watch the news, you see the pain and the war, you see the selfishness and greed in our world. And as a Christian, do you ever think to yourself, you know, Jesus, you've promised that you're coming back, so why just come? Why don't you just come? You could stop all this now. Why don't you just come? What is he waiting for? The answer to both questions is mission. God has placed you here as a Christian to be a missionary. Jesus isn't here yet because he's waiting for, in his infinite mercy, more people to come to him. And he wants to involve you in that. He is waiting for us to do our job. He's waiting for you and I to fulfill the reason that he has placed us here. And how, how are you doing with that? How is that going? Here we go. Half an hour of 25 minutes of guilt-ridden, I'm not doing well enough as a missionary preaching. I'm glad I came to church this morning. That isn't actually what I'm going to do this morning. I wanted to set the tone for mission, but that isn't what we're going to be looking at this morning. I instead want, I want to enthuse us about our faith again. If you've been a Christian for a while, maybe you've lost a bit of that. Maybe you have lost a bit of that sense of just how incredible your faith is. Just what an astonishing thing God has done for you. Just what, do you understand what you have? Do you understand for a second what you have? Because if you understood for a second what you had, you'd be out that door every single day pointing to Jesus with every single thing that you are. So let's remind ourselves what we have, shall we, this morning? I'm going to do a bit of evangelism on you, if you like. And that's why I've chosen Ephesians 1 this morning. One of the Greatest rallying cries for us in the whole Bible, I think. We're going to read the first 14 verses together. As we do, watch for 
the repeated phrase. There's a repeated phrase in here, which I think will be very obvious as we read it together. Ephesians chapter 1. Here we go. Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to God's holy people in Ephesus, the faithful in Christ Jesus. Grace and peace to you from our God, the Father, and the Lord Jesus Christ. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us in the heavenly realms with every spiritual blessing in Christ. For he chose us in him before the creation of the world to be holy and blameless in his sight. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him, we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. With all wisdom and understanding, he made known to us the mystery of his will according to his good pleasure, which he purposed in Christ to be put into effect when the times reach their fulfillment to bring unity to all things in heaven and on earth under Christ. In him, we were also chosen, having been predestined according to the plan of him who works out everything in conformity with the purpose of his will, in order that we, who were the first to put our hope in Christ, might be for the praise of his glory. And you also were included in Christ when you heard the message of truth, the gospel of your salvation. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are in God's possession to the praise of his glory. What incredible passage. What an astonishing summary of what we believe as Christians, of the hope that we have, of the truth that we hold. Did you spot the repeating phrase? In him. In him. In Christ, he is who we have. And it's worth taking a moment just to think about in him, what that means to be in him. Because I think we miss quite a lot of this. Have you ever had one of those days, you will have done, because I think we all do. Have you ever had one of those days where you've got to the end of it, and you've looked back on your day, and you have thought to yourself, I have not been a very good Christian today. I have done things I shouldn't have done. I have said things I shouldn't have said. I have thought things I shouldn't have thought. God is not going to have been pleased with me today. We've all had days like that as Christians. And that's good in a sense because... That's the Holy Spirit prompting us, showing us the things that we have done wrong and that we can say sorry for and start again. But do you ever take it a step further when you have a day like that and say to yourself, well, look at the day I've had. Look at the things I've done. I must, I must not be saved. Do you ever have days like that? Where you so question your own behavior, you think to yourself, Am I really saved? You know, if you, when you ask that question, you know what you are doing. You are trying to save yourself. You are trying to claim that your salvation is dependent on your own behavior. But if we are in Him, our salvation has been won already, it has been done. You know, when Jesus died for you, He died for all the sins that you have done, but he also died for the sins that you will do. And the Holy Spirit transforms us, the Holy Spirit improves us, the Holy Spirit changes us, but we're not sin-free this side of heaven. You know, when, when we sin in our lives, Jesus has already died for it. It's done. It's done. And when you start to understand that in here, 
when you start to understand that you are in him, your salvation is in him, not in you, in him. The irony is, the obedience becomes easier, better, clearer. Your life becomes so much more a so much more a vehicle for serving him because of that fuller understanding of what he has done for you. So if you are a Christian, you are in him. We're going to pull out three things this morning over the next few minutes that uh, we can pull out of Ephesians chapter 1 about what it means also to be in him because in him we are adopted, in him we are redeemed, and in him we receive our inheritance. Okay, we are adopted we are redeemed, and we receive our inheritance. So in him we are adopted, verses 4 and 5. Uh, read with me, uh, end of verse 4. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ. Okay, through Christ, we are adopted to sonship in accordance with his pleasure and his will. We are adopted. Uh, a couple of weeks ago, uh, as a family, we went to the theatre. We went to the theatre, and um, I did my job during the interval, which is uh, to go and get the ice creams. Go and get the interval ice creams. Um, you know, you've got to check your bank balance before you go and get the interval ice creams. It's like 900 pounds for that, isn't it? When you're serving yourself ice cream at home, you're not giving yourself that, are you? You're not giving yourself a mouthful. You get the ice creams, and then you've got to find the spoon. You've got, to then, you've got to find the spoon then, haven't you? Which is normally underneath the little cardboard thing at the top. I say spoon. It's, it's a little plastic version of that thing you do the car windscreen with, isn't it? That's what it is. One of those things, and you, try and you, you dig in like that, and then you flick it, and it's a person there. I'm so sorry, Hilly, we have an ice cream on you there. I'm so sorry about that. Um, anyway, you, you, you check your bank balance, and you end up in the queue for the ice cream. And by the time I got to the front of the queue, there was only one flavor left, only one flavor left, uh, and it was vanilla. Fine, all right, vanilla, whatever. So I paid, and I, I got all the tubs of vanilla out of the tray. You now you pick them out of the tray, and then you go back to the seat. And it wasn't until I got back to the seat that I'd realized that one of the tubs of ice cream I'd picked up in the kind of semi-darkness was... Vegan. That was an interesting reaction, wasn't it? <laughs> I didn't know how you'd react when I said the word vegan. It was mixed, wasn't it? It was mixed. Uh, it was vegan. One of them was vegan. Um, and so there was a small argument between ourselves as to who would have the vegan one. Um, but it, it was the same flavor. The tub was the same color, the same shape. The only way you knew it was vegan is because there was a little uh, like logo thing on the lid. Uh, but the contents were different. But it looked the same. It was the same color, the same flavor, the same price, and did the same job. What a great image that is of adoption. Contents are different. But brought in with the same rights, the same entitlement, the same job to do. You know, as Christians, we are adopted into God's family alongside Jesus. We are not Jesus. But we are adopted into his family alongside Jesus. The verb used for adoption here is hyothesia. Hyathesia, legally made into sons. Legally made into sons. And this idea is all over the New Testament. Romans 8. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The Spirit you received does not make you slaves. Rather, the Spirit you received brought about your adoption to sonship. We are adopted into God's family as a result of being in him as a result of the forgiveness of sins that Jesus' sacrifice offers us. But there's one other thing about adoption that we miss. A lot of the time, we miss this. You know, we know as Christians that we are forgiven for our sins. 
And that is wonderful enough. But that isn't all we get. Because our adoption means God doesn't just not treat us like we do deserve, but he treats us as we don't deserve. Do you know, when when God looks at you and all of those things that you do, he treats you as if you did all the things that Jesus did. He doesn't just treat you like you didn't do the things that you did do. He treats you like you did all the things that Jesus did. It's not astonishing. There's, um, uh, there's a Christian author and preacher called Tim Keller, who I'm, a, I'm an enormous fan of. He, he has a great analogy for this. He talks about an episode he once watched of the TV show NCIS. Have you ever seen NCIS? I've never seen NCIS. It's an American police thing, I think. I've never seen it. But this is what he says happens in, uh, happened in an episode of this he watched. He said that he saw an episode where there was this old man who was arrested by these big burly uh, security guards. He was arrested and he was being yanked along for some terrible thing he'd done. And as he was being yanked along, his tie got pulled aside. And underneath his tie, they saw that he was wearing the Congressional Medal of Honor. Now, the Congressional Medal of Honor is one of the highest civilian honors you can get in America. In America, the president awards it. And the moment that the security guards saw the Congressional Medal of Honor, they let him go and they snapped to attention. What are they saluting? The man? The things that he had done that had led to his arrest? They're saluting the medals. They're saluting the medals and what they represent. My friends, you are not only forgiven. Jesus didn't just die in your, in your place. Jesus perfectly obeyed so that his perfect obedience becomes yours. His medals are pinned to your chest. Do you understand that? Do you understand what you have as a Christian? God looks at you as he looks at Jesus. You are credited with Christ's achievements. You are not only not receiving death as a Christian, you are gifted glory. That is what adoption into God's family means. And I am reminded of Jesus' words on the cross. What does he say? My God, my God, Why have you forsaken me? The father turns his face away, as that worship song says. In that moment, Jesus loses his sonship. So you can gain yours. It's all down to him. Don't you want to show that to people? all staring at me like this. Don't you want to get out there and show that to people? Thank you, Jeff. I knew you'd agree with me at least. Alpha gives you a very easy way to do that. Back to our passage, again, from the end of verse 4. In love, he predestined us for adoption to sonship through Jesus Christ in accordance with his pleasure and will. Then, into verse 6, to the praise of his glorious grace, which he has freely given us in the one he loves. In him we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins in accordance with the riches of God's grace that he lavished on us. Not only are we adopted, we are also redeemed. In him we are redeemed through God's grace. Apolytrosis is the word here. Apolytrosis, buying back, it means. Buying back, repurchasing. Did you get any vouchers for Christmas? Any vouchers for Christmas? Have you spent them all yet? I've got a John Lewis one I'm wondering what to do with. I don't know what to do with it. But if you've, if you've spent your vouchers, 
you'll know. You, ever, you know, sometimes you get the digital ones, you get the cards as well. We've got to scratch the thing off the back to get the code. You know those ones? And then you, you go online and you put the code in the website. And what does it say next to where you put the code in? It probably says redeem voucher code. Redeem. This is the idea of redemption. The money has been spent. The money has been spent. The price has been paid. You are claiming the goods. God has paid a price to have you back. We forget that, don't we? We wander around our lives happily doing whatever we want. When the Lord Almighty, the creator of the universe, paid a price to have you back. You were expensive for him. You cost an absolute fortune. The cost of living crisis is causing all sorts of terrible problems for people. But you know, God had a cost of living crisis too. He paid a cost for you to live. He paid that cost, not you. He picked up the bill. You know, don't ever think that you are not worth anything. Don't ever get up in the morning and look in the mirror and think to yourself, I'm worthless. Because what being a Christian should give you is it should give you a sense of self-worth. Not arrogance. Not arrogance. Because it is your sin that held him there. So not arrogance. But self-worth, because while it was your sin that held him there, God's love for you meant that he did it. You are so valuable, so precious, so beautiful, so wonderful to him. That he spent what he needed to spend, money, no object, to redeem you. context of the use of that verb, apolyatrosis, was often used to mean to be brought out of slavery. Uh, The context of slaves being freed, buying a slave uh, their freedom. You were redeemed as a slave. It's a good way to think about what Jesus has done for us because we are slaves. What do I mean by that? Well, the misconception about Christianity is that it is restrictive, isn't it? It's what people say about Christianity. It's do's and it's don'ts, and it's you must live your life like this, and you mustn't do this. And it, the, the stereotype is that Christianity is restrictive, but it misses something profound about life, which is that all of us, believers or otherwise, are all restricted by something because we are all slaves to something. All of us are slaves to something. It might not be a slave to an addiction like that guy we saw on the video, but you're a slave to something because something gets you up in the morning. Something, there is a reason why you put one foot in front of the other every day. Something motivates you through your life. It could be your family, it could be your friends, it could be your job, it could be money. But whatever your reason for living is, is what you are enslaved to. Because your happiness, your contentment, is entirely dependent on it. And what if your reason for living goes? And it might. You'll lose family members. You could easily lose your job could easily lose your money and your security. And in the end, let's face it, it'll all go. You can't take any of it with you. It's all going to let you down. And if they are your reasons for living, if and when they go, you lose them. You've got no reason left. They're gone. You're lost. Your sense of self-worth is gone. Your reason for living is gone. Your sense of purpose is gone. You've got nothing left. You are done for. And none of those things are bad in and of themselves. 
You know, it's a great, of course you should love your family. Of course you should love your friends. Of course you should, it's great if you enjoy your job. But if your core reason for living is one of those things, you are enslaved to them. They are traps. They are in control of you because they control your happiness. There is one reason for living that will not leave you. That will not abandon you. That will not let you down. There is one key reason for being that isn't a trap. Because Jesus doesn't enslave you. He frees you. You are no longer a slave of the world. You are a child of God, adopted into his family, into eternal security, and into knowing whatever this life throws at you, whatever pain, whatever wrong, whatever sadness is. In the end, you know that you are safe, that you are secure, that he will never leave you because you have been freed from the slavery of this world. You can be truly you, the person God has made you to be as his child, using the gifts he has given you, loving the people around you. Whatever the world throws at you, you can be free when the driving force of your life is something who will not let you down. And isn't that what you want for your neighbors? Isn't that what you want for your work colleagues? Isn't that what you want for the people you share the school playground with? because of what Jesus has done, not because of anything you have done or will ever do. In him you are redeemed. And finally, in him we receive our inheritance. And I'll be quick with this one, I promise. Jump with me down to verse 13. When you believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit, guaranteeing our inheritance until the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his Glory. We are God's possession. Remember, he has bought us. He has redeemed us. We are God's possession. It reminds me of this verse of those. Do you remember you used to get, I suppose you can still get them, those infrared pens that you would mark your possessions with at home in case they were nicked? Do you remember those? And you used to to have, it was like a sticker you would put in your window that would go, don't rob this house because I've written on everything. That's basically what it said. Do you remember those things? I used to think, I don't know that's going to put anyone off. You've written in invisible ink on, a thing, on your VCR. Great, well done. VCR, that's how it aged me, isn't it? On your gramophone. A mark to protect you. A mark of security, a permanent mark of security. We have one, and that mark is the Holy Spirit. My friends, Christianity is not a hobby. If you turn up to church every week and sit here and you sit in the pew and you listen nicely, you sing some songs, that's nice, and you go home and you never think about it again until 10.30 next Sunday morning, uh, you don't have a faith, you have a hobby. Oh, hobbies are nice, aren't they? But faith is better. Christianity is not designed to be a hobby. It's not something we do in our spare time like stamp collecting or video games. It isn't something you can opt into or out of at any point in your life at your own convenience. Our faith is who we are. It is our core identity. It should be the first and main thing about us. That in our differences, in our personalities, in our varying likes and dislikes, We are first united in our shared identity as being redeemed by Christ. And what gives us that sense of unity? The Holy Spirit. God within us, prompting us, leading us, changing us. The Holy Spirit does a lot of things I haven't got time to get into. But one of the things, as Paul says here, is it gives us our deposit, guarantees our inheritance. What is our inheritance? Well, we've been adopted, remember, so we are heirs. You're adopted into a family, so you've become an heir. 
The Holy Spirit connects our present with the future, the promise of what is to come, the inherited blessings of being God's children. Heaven, eternity, security, peace, wonder. Don't you want that for them? The security of knowing where you are going. The security of of knowing you are marked, you are an heir of a glorious, wonderful inheritance that one day will be yours. The understanding that in the end, the love of God wins against the pain and the suffering and the agony of our world. Let me level with you for a minute as I come to the end. If you are understanding everything that I've said this morning, and you don't think your friend should hear that and understand that, then I don't want to be your friend. (laughs) Because there is a community of people outside those doors who have no idea about any of it. And who are probably not against it, particularly. You'd be surprised. Most people you speak to are not especially anti-faith. They just haven't thought about it very much. There are other things to worry about in life. It's not until they are faced with a problem or a tragedy or a major life event. Or until you or I do our jobs. Fulfill the reason that you and I are meant to be here. And if you don't understand what I've been talking about, then you come to Alpha. You come. You come here about Jesus. One final story. Um, Eugene Peterson. You've heard the name Eugene Peterson? Wrote the message version of the Bible. A pastor in America and writer of the message, which isn't a translation of the Bible as much as it's a kind of paraphrase of the Bible, but it is a helpful thing, I think, to read against a translation because it, it puts the Bible in modern parlance. He died a few years ago, Eugene Peterson. His son, Leif, spoke at his funeral. And here's what his son said about Eugene Peterson. He said, Dad, it's almost laughable how you fooled them. How for 30 years, every week, you made them think you were saying something new. They thought you were a magician in your long black robe, hiding so much in your ample sleeves, always pulling something fresh and making them think it was just for them. They didn't know how simple it all was. They were blind to your secret because for 50 years, you would steal into my room at night and you would whisper softly to my sleeping head. Always the same message, over and over. God loves you. He's on your side. He's coming after you. He is relentless. God loves you. He's on your side. He's coming after you. And he is relentless. God launched a great rescue mission for us. It was costly for him, so it might be freely available to you to you, to your friends, and to your family, and he invites us to be involved in the privilege and the joy of it. Get any good presents for Christmas? Doing any re-gifting? You know when you get a present you don't want, and so you give it to someone else as a present? Yeah, I can see you've got some. You've got some gifts you're passing on so you can get rid of them. What about passing on a gift that you don't have to lose yourself? What about passing on a gift that was free for you, but costly for God, and that other people really do need? The gift that you've received that's changed everything about your life, because in him, you have everything. Let's pray. 
Father, we thank you for who you are. We thank you that you are love. Love isn't something you have. It isn't something you possess. It is something that you are. And we thank you for what you have done for us. Forgive us when we lose the awe and wonder of it. Forgive us when we get complacent. And give us wonder anew at the example and the enormity of your love and sacrifice freely given for us. Encourage us to use all the tools at our disposal to show your son to others. Give us enthusiasm. Give us sensitivity. And if we need it, give us courage. Because in you, we have everything. Help us to give everything. We pray in the name of Jesus. Amen. We're going to watch a video because there is one final question that remains. And the question is this. Who are you inviting to Alpha? We all have that person in our lives. That neighbor we pass by every day outside our homes. That coworker we see at the office five days a week. Or those friends we catch up with every once in a while. People we wish could know and experience the love of God. How do we share it? Where do we even start? Deep inside, we know that it'll cost us something to open up our lives and share our faith. It takes time, vulnerability, sacrifice, the risk of rejection. But this is our call, to open our lives and to share Christ with the people close to us. Because it's only through opening your life up that spaces for honest conversations are possible. Spaces where people can truly be themselves and explore the deepest parts of life with people they know and trust. That's why we're running Alpha. It's a course over several weeks where you can invite your friends to explore life's biggest questions over a meal. It's a chance for you to invite that person into an honest conversation about faith. Because when it's hard to find the moment, or the words, or the courage, you can simply invite. Alpha, who will you invite? We're going to close with a song. And um, it's been great to spend time with you this morning. And why not come along tonight, 6.30? Well, see you at Alpha. See you next week, 10.30. But let's... Uh, Let's give the God, God the glory one more time. What a beautiful name. Stand and sing if you're able. You were the word of the beginning. One with God. Hidden glory in creation, now revealed in you are Christ. What a beautiful name it is, what a beautiful name it is, the name of Jesus Christ my King. What a beautiful name it is. Nothing compares to this. What a beautiful name it is. The name of Jesus. You didn't want heaven without us. 
Blessed week. See you again soon.